Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope that you had a wonderful weekend and that you got some rest and that you relaxed, maybe hung out with family or friends or just got some space to yourself. It's very good to see you. Um, I hope that you're ready to get back into it and not feeling too exhausted with midterms. I know it's that time of the semester and that you're very busy but I do appreciate it when you show up to class and when you come prepared and ready to get back into it. As always, we have good discussions in here and I think that today will be no different. We're discussing electoral systems. And as always, these institutions are Byzantine and complex and it takes a, a minute or two for us to fully unravel the sequence of of structures and all the different arrangements that go into these, these things. But one big thing that has come up over and over is that the way the system is set up matters a great deal. And it has a lot of impact on governance and electoral outcomes and representation, accountability, all these things that we consider so important to democracy. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna begin discussing electoral systems. We'll introduce the concept. We'll take a look at some of the different families of electoral systems. And I ultimately want to involve you and kind of work through some exercises that have to do with thinking about the way votes are counted and how they might change the, uh, the outcome or how they might lead to an eventual outcome in an, in an actual election. So we'll do this by looking at some examples of elect election outcomes under different systems. Before we get there, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I'll start to, to, to bring you in piece by piece as we go along. So it's so good to see you and, and welcome back. And good morning, good morning to you. So our starting point is this familiar question, how do we classify democracies. And you'll remember that so far we've used executive legislative relations to classify them. We've talked about parliamentary systems. We've talked about presidential systems. We've talked about semi-presidential or hybrid systems. All of these are differentiated based on the relationship between the executive branch and the legislative branch. But there are other ways of classifying democracies. And one other way is to think in terms of electoral systems and specifically the kind of system employed in that democracy. And an electoral system is a set of laws that regulate electoral competition between candidates, parties, or both. The electoral system has a lot to do with how we vote how many votes we cast, how we vote them, excuse me, how we cast them, how votes are counted, and then how eventually votes are translated into seats. You'll see that there are many, many different varieties of electoral system under the different families of electoral systems that we identify. But those different families have some general tendencies in common that we can use to, to set them apart and categorize them. But before we do, just take a look here at this data from uh, IDEA, which is the international database for uh, legislatures and electoral systems. You'll notice that 40% of the electoral systems in the world are majoritarian or what we'd refer to as first past the post. Here in the United States, we have majoritarian electoral systems. And in particular, we have single member districts where we cast a single vote for a legislator and the candidate who wins the most votes wins. And that means that they solely need to win a plurality, although they may also win a majority depending upon what proportion of the vote they get. That's a majoritarian or a single member district system. 40% of the world has a system like that, like we have in the United States, more or less. 
38% of the world has proportional representation where we vote and we may vote for one or more candidates, but the way the votes are translated in seats is there are multiple members in that district and the seats are divvied up according to the proportion of the vote that each party wins or yes, each party wins uh, or each candidate wins depending upon whether or not it's a closed or an open party list. This is a very different logic because it involves dispersing the vote according to the proportion that's won as opposed to giving the entire constituency to the winner of the race. We have mixed systems that combine elements of proportional representation and majoritarianism. Those are less common, about 14% of the world's systems fall into that. And then there are 2% of countries that don't have elections at all. And then there are 6% of countries falling under some combination of categories that doesn't fit neatly with with these families that we'll discuss today. But you'll notice that much of Latin America and well, parts of Western Europe use proportional representation. Although parts of Europe use a mix of proportional representation and majoritarianism. Much of Africa uses majoritarianism, but there also is a role for proportional representation as well. Of course, the United States and Canada, as well as Australia and the UK use majoritarianism or single member districts or first past the post. All of these labels will associate with majoritarianism, but we'll be discussing these in more detail this week. And in particular, we'll talk about some of the different variations the different families can take in terms of majoritarianism, proportional representation, and then mixed systems. So we distinguish between electoral systems based on the electoral formula that, that they employ. Uh, no, Christopher, we're not gonna go over chapter eight. We don't necessarily cover the same material in the reading and the lecture. The lecture usually is going to be much more encompassing than chapter eight. Political scientists, us, we distinguish between electoral systems based on the electoral formula that they employ. And I've already talked about single member district plurality systems or first past the post systems. I've talked about proportional representation systems and I've talked about mixed member systems. These are three separate families. And although the individual types of majoritarian or proportional system can vary. Uh, those different types that fall within the families all have in common that they use majoritarian or, or proportional logic or, or a combination of those two logics. And so first, right off the bat, you'll notice that there are many different variations. So, so for instance, even though we use majoritarian institutions here in the United States, you could be forgiven for not knowing that single member district plurality system is only one example of a majoritarian system. We also have the alternative vote, the two round system, the supplementary vote, the block vote, the party block vote, the single non-transferable vote, the board account. There are even some other forms too that aren't included on this list. When it comes to proportional representation, there can be list proportional representation or there can be single transferable vote. All of these different examples or different types ha have different implications for how we vote when we actually go to the polls. The mixed systems can be dependent or independent. The point that I wanna make to you is that votes can be translated into seats in a variety of different ways. And it does get very complicated very quickly when you get into the details. And 
when we talk about, for instance, electoral reform or the switch from one type of system to another, there can be very, very huge political implications, in particular when it comes to how easily or how difficult new parties can enter the system, the way that those different systems might penalize or, or advantage different candidates and so on and so forth. And so we're gonna be thinking about those political implications as we go along. And you'll notice that the discussion does weigh heavily uh, when it comes to, well, what choices are we making and what are the political implications and how will different groups or actors or parties be affected by different, by different types of systems? And on this, I actually want to pause and I want to begin to incorporate your input. And I want to ask you maybe the most obvious question of all, which is why does the type of electoral system matter? You know, how does this become consequential politically or socially? How does the electoral system affect politics? Based on your understanding of the reading, let's begin to discuss this question. So for example, here in the United States, we have majoritarian institutions. We have single member districts, first past the post, as we sometimes call it. How would the system be different if we had proportional representation where seats in a district are multiple and are distributed according to the proportion of the vote that individual parties receive. How would that change the system? Um, professor, can you re um, can you reiterate the question? I'm kind of confused a bit on why you're asking. Yeah. So the question is, why does the type of electoral system matter? You know, how do institutional differences affect politics? And so, for example, here in the United States, we have majoritarian electoral system. When you vote, you vote for a single candidate, and the candidate who wins takes the whole constituency. A proportional representation system would involve multiple members elected in each district and the proportion of the seats in that district would go to parties based on the proportion of the vote that they received. So how would these sorts of differences affect politics or how would the type of electoral system matter if we're talking about these kinds of differences. Haley says, if we had proportional representation, there will be more physical representation than majoritarian. Haley, can you just comment on what you mean by that in the chat? Just let us know. I don't, I don't disagree that the representation would be different, but I'm, I'm wondering um, what you mean. Justin says it would definitely change who gets elected and how they are elected. It changes which individual would represent a certain party or a certain region of the state. Let me ask you this. If seats are distributed according to the proportion of the vote that parties receive, are you more or less likely to vote for a third party? Jake, why are you more likely to vote for a third party? Uh, because it's not like a winner take all uh, type situation. So if as long as they meet like a certain threshold, 
then um, and I mean like assuming that the third party is like in line with your values um, more than like the Democrat or Republican party. But yeah, it's not like a winner take all thing. So they would at least have some some sort of representation um, as opposed to none at all. Good, good. So we're getting really good points here. And, and Jake starts us off by pointing out that, well, it's not winner take all, right? So it wouldn't be a single candidate taking the whole constituency. Instead, you know, two or three or four candidates would split up the constituency you know, or parties would split up the, the constituency. And so it's much more likely than that a third party or a smaller party gets some representation because they're not forfeiting all of their vote uh, because it's a, it's a winner take all system. And so in that regard, you're more likely to vote for a third party, right? Because you're persuaded that they, that they as long as they cross a certain threshold, that they will get some representation. Absolutely, and this is what we find too. It tends to be the case that in, in PR systems, the effective number of, of, of parties or the number of parties that get legislative representation is higher. And so that's true. Haley, do you wanna make a comment? Yeah, to uh, follow up what I was saying in the chat, um, the reason why I said like the makeup of our government would be like completely different between a proportional and majoritarian is because with proportional, like you as like an individual voter, you will be voting for more, like there'll be just generally like more people to like elect and it'll be more, more diverse in the end, instead of like majoritarian, where like, again, it's like the winner takes all system. So therefore you kind of have to align yourself with like a bigger party, even if like some of your values might be taken away. Good, so many, so many good points there. Uh, let's start with the first point, which is that when you expand the number of members in a district from one to say two or three or four or five, you're expanding the size of the legislature, right? You're enlarging it exponentially, literally. Every single district is getting much, much bigger by an order of two or three or four. You're going to have more members in the legislature. And as a result, you have a, a higher likelihood of having women and minorities and having groups that historically have been disadvantaged getting seats in Congress. And this is what we know. We find this in the, the most recent research women in particular are better represented in New Zealand since 1993 when that country implemented an electoral reform that transitioned the country from a majoritarian single member district system to mixed member district system. So Haley is absolutely right in that regard. And Haley is also right in pointing out that parties will also present themselves differently and candidates will too as, as well. Because think about, for example, you know, an example like Jill Stein, right? Green Party candidate, environmentalist. Jill Stein chose to run with the Green Party and retain her pro-environmentalist message as opposed to burying that message, moderating her views and running with the Democratic Party. Candidates have to make choices, right? If you wanna be viable in a majoritarian system, you've gotta water down and moderate your positions and run to the center more or less. In a system that is a PR system where there are more members in each district and where there's a dispersion of the vote according to the proportion of the vote won, candidates and parties don't have to, to water down their message in the same way because they have a better chance of being viable given the institutional framework. And so Haley's points are, are, are right on the mark. Efren says it would impact the power of political parties and how candidates present themselves. Touche. And you have them sort of holding their positions as opposed to maybe running to the center. Alika says more likely because they have more of a chance of winning at least something. Right, so as a, as a voter, you're more likely to vote for a third party, but also the party itself and the candidate in particular is more likely to retain their original message, right? Or maybe not moderate their original agenda. And so what you wind up with in these single member district systems where parties face an incentive to run, to run to the center and to try to catch as many voters as possible, you wind up with these big catch-all parties, these big tents where voters are strategic and calculating and how they vote. They don't vote for third parties and the major parties moderate their positions so as to catch the largest largest number of voters. But what you end up with is you, you end up with fewer parties 
that are more basic and more vanilla, more or less. And, and to a certain extent, that's the case in the UK too. Tyler says, depending on the, on the type of electoral system, we may find a legislature that's more diverse, which can entail having seats that represents minorities, just more overarching representation. Absolutely. And if you're not penalizing third parties, and if you're changing the incentives faced by parties as well as voters, it's very likely that the beneficiaries of that will be those smaller parties, while the those who sort of absorb the cost of that change would be those big parties, right? Those ones that benefit from single member district systems. You can then see why there are extraordinary vested interests. This system that is in place reproduces itself partly because the beneficiaries are in a position to uphold it precisely because they benefit from the, the going arrangements. Justin says, I would probably say likely because would that mean they would have a greater chance of holding a seat in the legislature? Absolutely. And not just a, a greater chance, but a greater chance of holding a seat without needing to win a plurality or a majority, right? That's the key, because it's not winner take all. As Karen points out, minorities are often left unrepresented. Tyler says proportional systems are also tend to have quotas, which are beneficial to the underrepresented women and minorities. Absolutely, this is, this is true, Tyler. And I, I know that you learned this from the Transitions to Democracy class, where we learned about how establishing quotas for the representation of women and minorities can be a useful uh, stimulant to, to democratic development. And it can facilitate democratization, especially in places that that um, have been historically very uh, hostile to minorities and women. And so in Latin America, for example, quotas are used widely at the party level and as well as the, the, the national level. So that, for example, the Argentine Congress is, is almost perfectly 50% men and women. Jake asks, do you think that if we did move to a PR system and expand the legislature, we might see further gridlock, gridlock in Congress? <clears throat> well, I don't know, because with more parties and a larger legislature, you theoretically have more potential for coalition building, and you can get a lot of different coalitions and a lot more coalitional variety than you could get with just these two parties. As it is, these two parties are locked in this, this zero-sum game and they don't really have a lot of incentive to cooperate and they view one's gain as the other's loss. And so I don't know if I'm able to answer that question, but I think that what you certainly do by moving to PR is you create more potential for coalition building and in more variety as far as coalitions are concerned doesn't necessarily mean that it's harder to form them if you have more parties, um, because individual parties can be very different from each other or very similar. And as long as you have contiguous positions, coalitions can generally be formed relatively easily in a, P, in a PR system. Um, whereas in a, in, a, in a majoritarian system, you're likely to have, have fewer parties and it, it can be difficult to form those coalitions if they're locked in a and competitive struggle with each other. So we've covered so far, and we've been discussing the concept of a majoritarian electoral system. And this is one where the, the candidates or the, the parties that receive the most votes win. Very straightforward. In the United States, we have a majoritarian electoral system. When you go to the polls, and you vote for a, the legislature, the Congress, you vote for a single candidate and the winner of the most votes wins. They must win either a plurality or a majority. They can win a bare plurality and win that race. As long as they win the most votes, they win. A single member district plurality system 
is also what we have. And this is the specific variant of majoritarianism that the United States has. And this is one where individuals cast a single vote for a candidate in a single district, a candidate with the most votes wins. Now, what's implied is that you can have majoritarian electoral systems that have multi-member districts, where voters cast multiple votes, or you can have majoritarian systems where individuals, voters cast a single vote. This is the type that we have in the United States. The United Kingdom, India, Canada, Nigeria, Zambia, New Zealand before 1993, these are all examples of single member district plurality systems. You as the voter cast a single vote for a candidate in a single member district. The candidate with the most votes wins, period. And so in local elections, you cast a single vote for you know, whatever position it is. It doesn't matter that voter turnout is 14% of the electorate. The winner of a plurality in that election wins that election. And so sometimes in, in the United States, people are elected to positions with like two or 3% of like the total possible vote, just because such a small share of the total electorate actually voted. And because they only had to win a bare plurality in order to actually win the race. And so as you think about this and you listen to these descriptions, think about all of the implications. We're not distributing the vote according to the proportion that's won. All you've got to do is win the most votes. And that can mean a plurality in those cases where there may be many candidates but a relatively small proportion of the electorate votes. This is an example of election results in a single member district plurality system. And these are results from the Corby constituency in the UK ele elections in 2010. So you'll notice first that no candidate in this race won a majority. One candidate won a bare plurality, but no one won a majority. In fact, to some degree, it was a relatively close race, even between the top three candidates. But who won this election anyway? Tell me in a private message. Karen, there's no majority uh, because there are four candidates. And in a single member district plurality system, and in a majoritarian system, you don't actually need to win a majority. You just need to win a bare plurality or the most votes. Keep your responses coming, everybody. Tell me in a private message. So this is a single member dist district plurality system. Uh, it does not involve a runoff. 
because no one has to win a majority, the winner of a bare plurality or the winner of the most votes wins the election. But there are variants that involve a runoff where a majority has to be won before a candidate is elected. In those types of systems, this would not be the end of the election. There would be a subsequent election or runoff between the vote getters or the top vote getters uh, so as to uh, determine that actual winner. But in this case, we don't need that. All we've got to have is a plurality in order to get the winner. And as you all are, are pointing out, the winner is, is, is Luis Bagshaw of the Conservatives with 22,886 votes or 42.2% of the vote. It's a bare plurality. Bagshaw won the race with that total eclipsing Phil Hope, as well as Portia Wilson and Roy Davies. And so Bagshaw wins the race. It's really that simple in a, in a single member district plurality system. Uh, but it can become a little bit more complicated with, with other variants of the single member district plurality system. So for example, the alternative vote is a system of preferential voting used in single member districts. And this is a, a situation where the voter votes more than once. And, and what you do is you basically rank one or more candidates or parties in order of your preference. And a candidate who gets an absolute majority is elected. Now, if you have seven or eight or nine or 10 or 15 candidates on the ballot, it's actually very unlikely that any individual will get an absolute majority. So if any, if no candidate wins an absolute majority, then what they do is the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated and her votes are reallocated to the other candidates according to the next highest preference expressed on each ballot until one candidate has an absolute majority. So basically, Every voter goes to the polls and they rank their choices from most preferred to least preferred. And if someone wins an absolute majority, they declare that person the winter, the winner. But if no one wins an absolute majority, they eliminate the one who got the least votes and they reapportion the loser's votes to the other candidates according to the preferences expressed on the ballots themselves. And so this is actually deceptively complicated. It seems like it would be straightforward and be obvious who might win the eventual race. But when you go through an example, you'll notice that it's not actually clear. It's not predetermined. And it matters a great deal based on the, the, the preference order of the individual voters. So you're voting more than once effectively and you're expressing your preferences for different candidates according to the extent to which you prefer that candidate. The alternative vote then gives voters much, much more choice and much more input, much more leeway, if you will, to express their preferences and, and make decisions in elections than if they were to just cast a single vote. So let's actually do this and we'll take a look at how an alternative vote works in practice. This is New South Wales in the district of Richmond in Australia in 1990. And this is the first count in this race. We have this list of candidates, we've got their vote total, and then we've got the proportion of the vote that they received. Now remember that we're paying attention to whether or not any of the candidates won an absolute majority. And you notice that no one won an absolute majority. So then we ask ourselves, which candidate is eliminated first? Tell me in a private message.
Yes, Karen. Very happy to see that there's a lot of consistency here and you know, virtually all of us are on the same page. You look at these results and again, we're, we're paying attention to whether or not anyone won an absolute majority. Did anyone win more than 50% 50 per, 50 of the vote? And as you all are pointing out, um, no, no one did. And the first candidate we eliminate is Gavin Bailey because Gavin Bailey received only 187 votes or 0.3% of the total, which placed him beneath Dudley Leggett and beneath everyone else on the list. And so we eliminate Gavin Bailey first. And what we do is we reapportion Gavin Bailey's votes in the second count involves the reallocation of those votes eliminated from Bailey in that first count. And we reallocate Bailey's votes according to the preference order expressed on the ballots of the voters themselves. And so this is what's interesting. Each subsequent count will reveal essentially a new pattern or a pattern that could not have been revealed by the first count's results. And so after eliminating Bailey, we've got our second count and we ask ourselves that same question. Do we have an absolute majority? Did any candidate win an absolute majority? And the answer again is no, no one won an absolute majority. We have not yet passed that threshold of 50%. And so what we ask ourselves is, who do we eliminate second? What candidate is eliminated second after reallocating Gavin Bailey's votes? Tell me in a private message. Again, I'm seeing a lot of consistency here. I'm very happy about that. Again, we're asking ourselves, when we look at these results, after noticing that no one won an absolute majority, who is the second lowest vote getter or who should be eliminated according to the rule that the lowest vote getter is eliminated? And as you're all pointing out, that individual or that candidate in this race, in this count, I'm gonna give everyone a little bit more space to, to message me directly with their response. So as you all are pointing out, Dudley Leggett is the candidate who we eliminate second because Dudley Leggett received the second lowest total or proportion at, at barely 0.4% of, of the vote or 294 votes. And so what we do is we identify Leggett and we eliminate Leggett and reapportion Leggett's votes, 294 votes, and we reapportion those votes, again, according to the preferences expressed, the rank order preferences expressed on the ballots themselves. And so again, we do this process where it's not predetermined. The third count then gives us this, where we've eliminated Leggett and Bailey, 
And yet again, you notice that we don't have an absolute majority. No candidate has yet won an absolute majority. And so what we ask ourselves is, who do we eliminate now? Who is the third candidate to be eliminated based on the rule that the lowest vote getters are eliminated until a candidate has won an absolute majority? Tell me in a private message. So as you're all pointing out correctly, Ian Patterson is the candidate who we eliminate third. We eliminate Patterson and we now reapportion Patterson's votes. And we ask ourselves, first of all, has anyone received an absolute majority? Still, we're in the fourth round. No one has received an absolute majority. So we just keep doing this. We just keep apportioning the vote until we have eliminated the lowest vote getters and someone has won an absolute majority. And you'll notice again that at each stage, the, the count is not predetermined. There's no way of knowing based on the third count, what the fourth count will be. Because you've got to actually go back and re-examine the ballots themselves. So we ask ourselves, now that we can see that no one has received an absolute majority, who do we eliminate fourth? And well, we eliminate Sims fourth, right? We go forward and we reapportion Sims votes. And we ask ourselves, has anyone received an absolute majority? And you notice that still no one has received an absolute majority. And so we then ask ourselves, who do we eliminate next then? And whose votes are reapportioned? Gibbs received 6.8% of the vote. Stan Gibbs is the next lowest vote getter. We eliminate Gibbs. We reapportion those votes. We're now beginning to get closer, but we still have yet to arrive at an absolute majority. We're still, still not able to cross that threshold. We ask ourselves then, who do we eliminate next? Well, we eliminate Caldecott. And we then find ourselves in the seventh count. We've got two left and we ask ourselves, has anyone won an absolute majority? And at the very end with no one left, we find that Neville Newell has won an absolute majority, just barely beating Charles Blunt. But remember, that the very, very beginning of this, Newell was not the one who had the largest proportion of the vote. Actually, Charles Blunt had substantially larger proportion of the vote than did Newell. And yet in the end, Newell won. The reason is because when the votes of those other eliminated candidates were reapportioned according to the preference list of the ballots, it changed the actual outcome as compared to the first count.
Jocelyn says, when you say reapportioned, does that mean they gave Dudley's number of votes and reallocated them based on the percentage of votes each candidate have? Let's say Charles Blunt has 41.2% of the votes. Blunt would get 41.2% of Dudley's 279 votes. So it's, it's, it's not quite like that, Jocelyn. It, it's a little bit different. So let's go back to the first slide um, that, that discussed this type of, of ballot. So what happens is if a, no candidate wins an absolute majority, we do take the candidate with the fewest votes and we eliminate them. When we reallocate those votes, we're not reallocating them according to the proportion of the votes received by individual candidates. We're allocating them and reallocating them according to the next highest preference that is expressed on each ballot. And so when each candidate, when each voter votes, they, they have essentially one first vote, right? One vote, but they have a list of preferences. I prefer this candidate most, this candidate next most, and so on and so forth. And so when they eliminate those candidates who received the smallest share of the vote, the votes of those eliminated candidates are reapportioned according to the next highest preferences expressed by the voters themselves. So it's not the percentage of the vote that they have, it's the preference order expressed by the voters on their ballots. And so it's a slight difference. So what's so neat about this is that this is majoritarianism, right? This is a way of counting votes and translating them into seats that still basically relies on the same principle that the winner of the most votes should win the race, right? That's a majoritarian logic, but this is clearly very, very different than what we have in say the United States where we have single member districts and where we don't get to express our preference order where we're simply called upon to vote for one candidate or another. This is a different sort of system. And you know, as we begin to wrap up for today, I actually wanna ask you all, you know, is this the kind of system that you think might work well in the United States? How would this work here? Is this a system that we would like to have and that we would benefit from? Would we have more choice and more freedom if we had a system like this? What do you think? I think the US would benefit just because there's so many minorities within the nation and it's a big nation. So anytime we create multiple counts or we create an opportunity for people to express their preferences, you create a possibility that minorities or smaller parties or candidates from smaller parties might be more successful in elections, right? Look at Newell. Newell didn't even win a plurality of the vote in the first round and wound up actually winning the election. Karen suggests that a system like this could have a, a similar impact in that, you know, maybe we wind up with more diversity, better representation for smaller parties, or just more choice for voters more generally. I think that this is a thread that we should pick up again on Wednesday, everybody. We will do that and we'll talk about more examples of different types of majoritarian and uh, proportional systems. But we'll be working with some election results in a similar way and I'll be involving you in a similar way. So I'll see you on Wednesday, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here and um, have a lovely rest of your day.